Good morning. Welcome to Trinity United Methodist Church. If we haven't had the chance to meet yet, my name is Pastor Robert, and I have the privilege of doing the welcome today because Shelby Fullerton is on a well-deserved vacation. Uh, and I know for a fact she is watching the live stream right now, uh, so it's good that you all clap for her. She will feel the love from afar where she is attending a high school class reunion in South Carolina. So... Uh, just a few housekeeping reminders as we start. We invite you to sign the attendance pad that is in your pew. If you haven't seen it yet, likely someone at the other end of the pew is sitting on it. So remind them to uh, grab that, give us their autograph, and let us know that they are here. Uh, you can also say, call them by name and say, I'm sure glad you were here in worship. And again, a special welcome to those of you joining us online from wherever you are. We are glad that you were participating and worshiping God with us today. And as we begin, let us pray together. Spirit of the living God, would you fall fresh on all of us who have gathered here or from wherever we are this morning. We are ready to continue studying the greatest sermon ever preached from the words and the mouth of Jesus himself. Would we have eyes to see? Would we have ears to hear and a heart ready to receive whatever it is you have to say to us today? And we all said together... Amen. remain seated, but join me in our call to worship that you can follow along with on the screens. We gather today to remember. We gather today to remember. We gather together to remember. Our risen Thanks be to God. Amen. The stuff arranged here. In her absence, Shelby always thinks of you and us. And as usual, she has given me a beautiful piece to read to introduce our first hymn. It's called Easter People Raise Your Voices. You may not be familiar with the title, but when we start to sing, I think you'll remember the tune. This piece was written by Janita Craniac, who is a United Methodist pastor in another conference. This is the opening line of a hymn written by William M. James in 1979 for the United Methodist congregation that he was serving in New York. He was a champion of civil rights, and he led his congregation through the gift of music. 
The idea behind the words to this particular hymn was to remind us that as Easter people, we are not to become complacent as Christians. We are to continually look for places and ways to raise our voices to share the good news. But we are also supposed to look for places and ways that we can use our voices and our actions to help God right wrongs. On the morning of the resurrection, there was a renewal of a commitment to go forth in the name of Jesus Christ, first by Mary Magdalene and then by the apostles. When Easter Sunday comes, Christians are quick to say, He is not here within the safety of our walls and our sanctuaries. But what happens on Easter Monday when life returns to normalcy? When the alleluias and the hymns fade into the background waiting for the next Easter Sunday celebration? Are we still Easter people? Do we still raise our voices in opposition to injustices and evil in the world around us? Do we still live like Easter is every day? The power of the resurrection should be evident every day, which would indeed make every day for us an Easter. In the words of Mountain Sky Conference Bishop Karen Olivito, she says, Every time we see someone deal with their addictions, there's a resurrection going on. Every time we see someone face their deepest wounds and start the healing process, there's a resurrection going on. Every time we see people engaged in reconciliation, there's a resurrection going on. Every time we see someone commit themselves to another, every time we see a commitment to the welfare of children, Every time we see someone working for the rights and dignity of someone else, every time we see a community come together with vision and energy for change, there is a re resurrection going on. The resurrection happened, and there is still a resurrection going on all around us if we open our ears, our eyes, and our hearts as we live as Easter people. Would you please stand with me and let's sing this wonderful hymn. We continue to worship by saying together what we believe. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, 
to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect and creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. be seated. At this time, I want to invite several members of our church's leadership team, which is called the guide team, to come and share some news with the congregation. Good morning. I'm Donna Youngman, and I'm chairing the guide team this year. It's my honor to chair the guide team for three years now. So, as many of you know, the clergy pastor deployment system is called the itinerant system. Under this system, the bishop po appoints or sends ordained pastors to their assignments. Appointments are for one year. The pastors are obligated to accept these assignments. That's a simple explanation. In it, actuality, it's a very complex si situation where the bishop, the cabinet, our district superintendent, our guide team, and our pastor all have input into these appointments. Um, in addition to all those considerations, all the other United Methodist churches, their needs and their situations are also included. And most importantly, we trust that the Holy Spirit is involved in making these appointments and placements for the good of all. So this year, all of the planning and placements have happened, and today is Announcement Sunday. But before I'd like to turn this over to Dave, I'd like us all to recognize our other pastor, Reverend John Fulcrod. <laughs> John is a retired United Methodist pastor from the East Ohio District. He and his wife, Cinda, uh, came to Trinity in July 2022, and quickly they became involved in the life of the church. He came on staff this past January 1st as our part-time pastor of congregational care and discipleship development. That's a mouthful. Uh, pastor John is not part of our Florida United Methodist pa uh, appointment system. <laughs> He's already done that in Ohio. He doesn't want to do that again. He has been such an addition to us. Um, he's brought wonderful leadership with his friendly and wise manner. He fits himself to, into any situation where he sees that he can make a contribution. Um, and he brings all of his years of experience uh, with him to that situation. We at Trinity are so fortunate to have him blessing us, and we would like to show him how much we appreciate him. Let's let him know that, please. Good morning. I'm uh, Dave Crookshank. I'm your lay leader, and in that capacity, I am your liaison between you, the congregation, and our pastor. In the same light, I'm also the liaison between our pastor and the congregation. 
And my role is basically what I do is I listen, I observe to what I hear from you, and I pass it on to the pastor, and he in turn does the same to me. And then we sit and we talk about that. We meet uh, regularly, monthly, or as needed, and we talk about what we've heard, what we have observed, what can we do more effectively, and perhaps how I may fit into that process. Now, it has been an amazing year for us this past year. When we look back and we look at our attendance, we find that our attendance is up about 20%, and we're so happy about that. <laughs> and and that, in, that includes both services. In addition to that, our giving is up close to 25%. In addition to that, are the new members that we have brought into Trinity uh, are several fold more than what we have done in years past. And then on top of that, our small groups that we have are growing. They're expanding in attendance, and we have new small groups and more on the horizon. And in addition to that, I also want to point out that the enthusiasm of this church is unbelievable. I've watched it this past year, the past two years since Pastor Robert has been here, and it just keeps growing and growing and growing, and we're so thankful for that. When we look back over the last two years, when Robert came on, on board, he outlined to the guide team uh, his priorities and his plans. And first and foremost, he informed us is that he wants to come here every Sunday and he wants to give an inspiring, uh, meaningful, spiritual sermon to, uh, to us. And I think we can say we have gotten that week after week. <laughs> The second thing he wanted to do is to make sure we are mission-oriented as a church, that we reach out to other people and make a difference. And third was to strengthen our small groups that we have, um, both in attendance and, and try to increase those as, as we have done, and also um, improve our congregational care that we have. We've always had that, but we recognize we needed to do more, and we have done more. But with the addition of John coming on staff, to help us out with our small group development as well as congregational care, I think our future in those two areas look nothing but better for the future, and we're grateful for that. I want to come back also and talk about Robert for a second. He's a man of vision, priorities, and plans, and as a result, he's able to communicate that to his staff. And they know as a result of that where they're going, and they can plan accordingly. And that's why we're seeing the kind of progress that we're seeing in our church. It's not just Robert, but our staff too. It's a team effort, and we're grateful for that because he knows how to pull a team together. Finally, I wanted to reinforce uh, our mission-oriented uh, focus as a church. This is something that we must do, and we've been doing it, and we have really reached out in those past two years to strengthen our uh, orientation of missions and our mission partners that we have and the awareness of that. You see almost every single week we are featuring one of our mission pa partners up on the, on the screen here, or we have them present. But, in addition to that, we, our mission program is locally focused with um, our focus on organizations such as Help to Home, the Solve House, Sug Middle School, um, and there's many others. But in addition to that, it's internationally focused as well with Haiti and Cuba and the DR. These are the things that we've been able to accomplish, and it's been a great year, great two years for us, but there's more in the future, and I'd now like to turn that over to Beth. Thank you, Dave. Good morning. Uh, my name is Beth Clark, and I also am on the guide team and, and with a focus on staff parish. Uh, in my real job, I'm the Chief Operating Officer for the Boys and Girls Clubs of Manatee County. So I've been involved with Boys and Girls Clubs for 44 years throughout the country. I've seen a lot of leaders, some good, some not so good. 
But I have to tell you, we have found a visionary leader in Robert. Looking forward in the future, we have Vacation Bible School coming, we have the, the community garden, we have summer camps, we have a continuing of our missions, community events are so bountiful now. And we're also so excited to have Pastor John, I gotta put my, my two cents in too. <laughs> we're so thrilled to have him because that, that congregational care and those small groups are so important to make our church grow. I get to make the announcement, which I am ex exceedingly thrilled about, that Pastor Robert, Jessica, and Harden will be with us over the next year and into infinity and beyond. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you all. This is the trouble with giving people microphones. I told them they had three minutes, and look what happened. <laughs> well, Jessica and Harden wish they could be here to thank you and share your love, but Harden's at home with the runny nose and the sniffles this morning, so Jessica is there, so they're sending their love as they join from online as well. But uh, I just want to say it's been a tremendous, a tremendous three years, and I feel like I'm just figuring out which keys open which doors on this campus and where everything is, and I take that as a good sign from God that we are just getting started, and there is still plenty of good work and ministry left to do, and there are just are not words to share how lucky Jessica and Harden and I and our family feel to have been sent to your church and that you have welcomed us with open arms and continue to do so every single week. So from the bottom of our heart, thank you, and let's keep doing what we're doing. We pause now for our time to come together as a congregation with one voice and with one mind as we go to the Lord in prayer. Would you pray with me? In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says these words. God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. Be happy about it. Be very glad, for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. And then Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth and you are the light of the world. Oh Lord, we studied these words just a week ago, and we remember they are what's called the Beatitudes or the Blessings, and we continue now to study the greatest sermon ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus offers so many thoughts, ideas, and concepts that turn what so many before had believed upside down or on its head as he brings the kingdom of heaven to earth in the flesh. Lord, and so many things in this sermon can be challenging. They could be confusing. When Jesus says, but you are to be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect, we as human beings have to say, is that even possible? And yet we know through Christ all things are possible. And we call this journey towards perfection sanctification or this lifelong journey in which we try to make the words of the Beatitudes, the words of the Sermon on the Mount, the words that are on our heart and our minds, that they simply become who we are. That we don't, as Paul says, become conformed to the world, but rather we are in the world and like Christ. We are the salt and we are the light. 
And in Christ's lightness and light, there is no darkness at all. For we know we don't have to look far to see darkness. We don't have to look far to see brokenness. We don't have to look far to see suffering or pain or poverty or crime or violence. And Jesus came to offer us an alternative, a better way. And Jesus doesn't just say for us to close our eyes and pretend like it doesn't happen, but Jesus calls us to be his disciples, to go out into the world and make a difference, to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world, to offer hope that there is a better way. A way that leads to a life of mercy and grace and forgiveness. A second chance and most importantly to life eternal. To all who would put their trust in the resurrected Jesus Christ. O Lord, may our confidence and our hope be in you. And so we offer this prayer now and we pray together the words that you taught us saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Last week we took a good bit of time in worship to share all of the things that are coming up in the month of April that you might find interesting or want to be a part of, but rather than share a big long list of announcements with you in worship, instead I'm going to tell you where on a weekly basis you can find out all of that information on your own and be reminded about it because your announcement Sunday present to me is to never tell me again, I had no idea that was happening at our church. Our team works very hard to communicate all the things that are going on, not to brag about how busy we are, to have a full schedule, but to help everyone find a place to get connected, to help everyone find a place to belong and to serve and be a part of what matters most to you. Uh, so just a reminder of a bunch of places you can find these things. Pick one, pick them all. It's up to you. Uh, if you're on social media, we have a Facebook page. We also have an Instagram and we're on YouTube. That's where we stream our services and post information every single week. And there are a lot of you on YouTube right now. Uh, we also have a church website, trinitybradenton.com, that we update all of the time. But if you think, I'm not a social media person, I don't like the internet, I need a hard copy of something. That's why we created bulletins. And we put all the announcements every single week there. You could take that with you. I ask that you make a spot for us on your refrigerator. And every week, take last week's bulletin off and put this one on. Then you're reminded of what's going on and you think about what you did in church all week long. We also have bulletin boards strategically placed all around campus where you go and you can take pictures of what's going on and if you ever go to the bathroom on campus we have potty papers now where you can see what's going on while you take care of your business. <laughs> If you get here early, the announcements are always up on the screens. They'll be playing after the service as well. And we have an email newsletter that goes out every single Thursday at 4 p.m. directly to your inbox. And if you're not signed up, we can do that for you. And last but not least, we still have telephones in the office. You can give us a call. You can send us an email and ask your questions. And folks like Mary and our volunteers and Rachel would love to fill you in with what you are missing. There are a lot of ways that we share this information because, again, we want you to feel connected and feel like you know what is going on at your church. But I am going to share a few things that are going on just to make sure if none of that works, hopefully you listen to your pastor for a few minutes every week. The first thing I want to celebrate with you is yesterday our Kathleen Circle hosted a yard sale out at the pavilion to benefit Help to Home, and they raised over $2,000. So we wanted to celebrate their hard work and their leadership. 
Uh, and the Help to Home groundbreaking for their new project is tomorrow afternoon. I'll be there, and so will many others from our congregation, and you're invited to come as well. Uh, new member class is tomorrow night at 6 p.m. over in the fellowship hall. Uh, come have dinner and learn more about Trinity, and hopefully uh, God is speaking in your heart that you are ready to make Trinity your church home. And by coming, that doesn't mean you've officially made up your mind, but it's a good way to come and spend some time with Pastor John and I, other of our church leaders, and our staff. Uh, this is the last time I'll be able to remind you that on Saturday of this week at 8.30 a.m., we're going to be building the community garden. If you pulled in from that end of campus today, you saw all of the weed mat has gone down. The gate is going in. There's electric and there's water, and we need help to finish that project on Saturday, uh, and I'd love to have you there. Don't forget, on Monday the 22nd is the blessing of the pets, so if you have a pet, you are invited to come. Uh, it doesn't. This is not a kid ministry specific event. I do have one rule. You are not allowed to bring your pet snake. Okay? I will not bless it. I will not do it. And do not bring a spider. If you bring a spider... <laughs> Anyway, uh, the parade party is the last one I want to share with you. It's at the end of the month. It's on Saturday, April 27th this year. The DeSoto Parade that goes down Manatee starts at 8 p.m. So our party will be from 6.30 to 8. We'll have inflatables and face painting and games and hot dogs and hamburgers. And we're going to mark off most of our parking lot for members and friends of Trinity. Uh, so you can come and have a great spot and fellowship for the parade. Now, all of that is only possible, and we can only do those things because as a church, we all give a little bit of what we have. We share in the burden of what it takes to be a church and to be in ministry together, and so that's why every week we take an offering. We give you the opportunity to be involved in something so much bigger than yourself. Uh, several ways you can give in just a couple of moments. Our ushers are going to pass the plates up and down the pews if you're ready to make your gift now. If you need a little more time, there are giving boxes near all of the exits of the sanctuary. Or uh, you can scan the QR code that is on the screen or in your bulletin. It will take you directly to the church website where you can make a one-time or reoccurring gift to the operating budget of the church. Uh, and I have it set up where every Sunday at 10 a.m., uh, my gift for our family is made. I get an email that tells me so, and it feels good to know that I have given and made a difference this week. And if you've never given to the church before, maybe today's a good day to try that. And I promise you, once you click that submit button, a smile will come to your face. And if not, there's only one way to find out, right? But thank you, thank you, thank you for your generosity, for your faithfulness. And like I say all the time, I still believe God is working and doing incredible things at our church. And it's because of you working together and being a disciple. Ushers, please come and serve us now.
In Psalm 133, it says, How good and wonderful it is when brothers and sisters come together and do good. God, we offer these gifts from your children and ask that you would do good with them and use us in the process. For we are your servants and your disciples, and we thank you for the chance to be partners in what you are doing here in Bradenton and beyond. And we all said together, Amen. Please be seated. very quick announcements before I, I begin this morning. Uh, one is I would like to just encourage you to be part of, of the building of the community garden next Saturday. That is going to be a transforming event in the life of this church, and I can promise you, you will be glad if you're here, and come Sunday if you come and when you see it, you're going to be disappointed if you weren't. So avoid the disappointment and come, and a lot of hands will make for much lighter, quicker work. We saw that so well when we packed all those uh, food packages for Haiti. <clears throat> so next Saturday, 9 to 1, and uh, we'd like to, to get maybe three, four, five, even six wheelbarrows that are in good working order to come and help move some things that will make life a lot easier. The, the other announcement is that it dawned on me as I was listening to the, the wonderful music today that we could have the benediction right now. Everybody could go home and you'd be incredibly blessed. However, I would prefer you didn't do that. I would like to share our scripture lesson today. It, it's part of, of one of the more difficult series of passages in the Gospel of Matthew and in the Sermon on the Mount. And, and I am truly thankful that Robert asked me to preach on, on this series of passages because it's been tough. It's, it's required me to stretch. And whenever that happens, two things I can count on. One is that I'm going to get an awful lot out of the whole process of developing a sermon, and it, it always works that way. The other is that I'm not going to sleep very well the night before because I'm, I'm so excited and enthused about the Sunday morning that's to come. So if you see me nod off a little bit, don't worry, I'll bounce back very quickly. <laughs> I'd like to share with you our scripture lesson, which comes at the beginning of, of this series of passages that are mistakenly referred to as the antitheses, or better, the extensions, or what I like to call invitations to a fulfilling faith. I invite you to listen. Do not even begin to think that I've come to do away with the law and the prophets, I have, have not come to do away with them, but to fulfill them. I say to you very seriously that as long as heaven and earth exist, neither the smallest letter nor even the smallest stroke of a pen will be erased from the law until everything there becomes a reality. Therefore, whoever ignores one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same will be called the lowest in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps these commands and teaches people to keep them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. I say to you that unless you, your righteousness is greater than the righteousness of legal experts and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. 
May God open our hearts to hear his word in new and powerful ways. My stepfather was a, a psychiatrist, and, and we'd have many wonderful conversations because we both were involved with the care of people. And, and so he'd, he'd send me things from time to time, and he sent me these things and said, I'm sure you'll appreciate these. I thought I'd share them with you. These are actual transcripts from courtrooms. What gear were you in at the moment of impact? Gucci sweats and Reeboks. It gets better. Is your appearance here this morning pursuant to the de deposition notice which I sent to your attorney? No. This is how I dress for work every day. <laughs> but my favorite is this. Did you blow your horn or anything after the accident? No, before the accident. Well, yeah. I played the trumpet for 10 years and even went to school for it. <laughs> well, what these do is they show us that sometimes there is a, a difference in communication and what the sayer wants us to hear and what we hear might be worlds apart. And that's a humorous illustration. It's not so humorous when we come to the Sermon on the Mount, but it happens there too. And this section of, the, of Matthew's Gospel, 5, verse 17, which I read to you through uh, a portion of that beginning, all the way to chapter 48. There, it is called, like I said, the antitheses or, or the extensions, and I like to call them invitations to a fulfilling faith because as I prepared for this sermon, there was so much there. It wasn't a process of, wow, what in the world am I going to say this Sunday? More, it was, there's so much there. How in the world am I going to say it all? And it dawned on me that nobody came this morning thinking that they'd like to have a sermon that started like now and ended it, ended it about quarter of six this evening. So, so I had to wrestle with that and, and come to terms with what I wanted to preach on. And, and so I focused on this whole concept where Jesus says, I've come to fulfill the law. What in the world does that mean? And if we could have the slide on, on the, the extensions, that would be helpful. <laughs> if not, I'm going to read them. No, that's not the one. <laughs> I think I'll read them. <laughs> the first of, of the extensions has to do with murder. And Jesus Christ teaches to focus on the danger of anger. The second is around adultery. And Jesus Christ teaches us to focus on the danger of lust. The third is about divorce, and Jesus sharpens the focus. The next one is about false oath-taking, and Jesus says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. I have a feeling that James got that from the Sermon on the Mount. Just a thought. The next is about retaliation and revenge. And Jesus says, turn the other cheek. The last is about loving our neighbor. And Jesus says, don't just love your neighbor, love your enemies as well. Well, let me say what these are not. These are not a measuring stick for us to determine whether in, we're inferior or superior to someone else. They're not something to be taken literally either. There is a huge, huge difference between what the people of Jesus' time were hearing when he talked about divorce and what we talk about when we talk about divorce today. 
Likewise, there was a huge difference between the cultural understanding of adultery that Jesus' hearers were hearing and what we think of as adultery today. And so to simply take them literally and transpose them today is to do a great injustice to Jesus' teaching, and it also is to do a great injustice to us and others. And lastly, they're, they're not an impossible list of things that we say, oh my goodness, these are way beyond me. There's no way I could ever do this. So it must be that grace has to take over. That's, that's a terrible lie. And you know, the reason lies are so powerful is they have a kernel of truth in them. That's a, that's a great example of a lie. It, it's, it's not something we just give up and, and give in. So let's look at them a little bit more closely from the lens of what is in the passage I just read to you where Jesus is talking about fulfilling the law and he uses two words, faith and righteousness. Faith, it comes from the Greek word pistos, Five simple letters, but that word has so many different translations. I think the, the number is somewhere around 15 or 16 or 17 possible translations. And the best New Testament scholars that I know say the best translation is obedient trust that faith is obedient trust. It's not something we hold on to or have. It's something we live into. Faith is dynamic, not static. And it comes through the process of obediently trusting. That's how faith works. The minute we become certain of things, Faith has gone bye-bye, and we've become in control. Faith is obedient trust. If you've heard me say it before, don't worry. You'll hear me say it again. Not because I don't have anything else to say, but because it's so doggone important that we get this. And there's way too much misunderstanding of what faith is. It's obedient trust. And it's connected to righteousness. Jesus says in the end, your faith needs to be greater than that of the legal experts and the Pharisees. Faith, when we're living faith, when we're obediently trusting God, righteousness is the result. You see, righteousness is a description of being in a right relationship with God. Or let me put it in even more basic terms. Righteousness is when our lives are reflecting the life that God intends for us. That's righteousness. And faith is the gateway to righteousness. It's the entry point for living the life that God created us to live. And the question is, how do we do it? Well, some people try to do it by trying harder and harder and harder and putting forth more effort. I like the image of the closed fist for that. That's effort. But have you ever noticed when your fist is closed, you can't wipe away a tear? Have you ever noticed when your fist is closed, you can't hug somebody? When your fist is closed, you can't comfort somebody or put a Band-Aid on a cut or extend a hand to help someone up or extend a hand of fellowship. Trying harder isn't the answer. 
And then there's a limp wrist. That's giving up. That's, that's a cop-out. Excuses are lies dressed in Sunday clothing. And they're, they're things we tell ourselves to satisfy our guilt. Giving up is just really, let me be candid as can be, that's just laziness on our part. So, oh, I'm going to leave this up to God's grace. That's, that's laziness. But there's a third way, and that's with our hands open to receive. This is the posture of surrender. I went to see uh, a person in the hospital in Boardman uh, when I was uh, on the staff there, and he was awaiting a very special, difficult, dangerous surgery. And as I was getting ready to go into the room, I was bracing myself for what I might experience in terms of anxiety and fear. And I walked into the room, and it was utter calm and peace. It, it startled me so that I said, What's going on here? Aren't you having major surgery in a few hours? He said, yeah, I am. I, I said, well, I'm overwhelmed with the sense of peace and calm and assurance that's, that's just radiating in this room. And he reached into the nightstand and he pulled out a little book. It was... It was his book from AA. It had the 12 steps in it, and there were devotional thoughts in it. And he said, you know, I'm, I'm an alcoholic. He said, but really, I'm a recovering alcoholic. There's a big difference, you know. And I did know at that point there was. And he said, when I first got into AA and I, I looked at the first step, I, I am powerless over alcohol. He said... I agreed with that. I accepted it. But nothing changed with my drinking. And I asked my sponsor, what's going on here? I, I've done the first step. I've accepted that I'm powerless over alcohol. He said, no, you've just thought about it mentally. You've accepted it. You've agreed with it up here, but there's nothing that's happened down here. He said, it's only when you surrender to the reality of your situation that you're going to discover the power of the first step and those that follow it. And he said, you know, after a while I began to think as I experienced how that was working, I said, well, what about my faith? I had accepted Christ into my life, and, and I but I didn't have any power with that. And he said, I began to think, oh, did I just do that up here? Did I just agree that that was a good idea, that I could agree with that? He said, then I began to realize that what I needed to do was surrender my life to Christ, and that's where the power came. That's when things began to change in my life. And it was evident as I walked into that room that righteousness was there because he was in a right relationship with God. He was resting in God's peace. And that was a direct result of his surrender. Now, the next thing I want to tell you about, and I'm going to do it quickly because Robert told me to look at the time, and I am. And, and <laughs> I listen on occasion, <laughs> but I don't listen all that well. But Jesus focuses right with murder and anger, and he gets right to anger and that's a disturbing passage, but he's getting at the heart of the issue, the danger of anger in our lives and what that can do to us. There are two types of anger. There's righteous anger, 
And there's destructive anger. Righteous anger is what we feel rightly when injustice is done. When someone in God's creation is treated unjustly. That leads to righteous anger. We've got a wonderful example of it when Jesus overturns the the money changers' tables in the temple because they were soaking the poor. We can experience righteous anger. For example, I bet you experienced righteous anger on October 7th. And I bet you, I hope you did anyway, experienced righteous anger a couple weeks ago when the the food people were strafed and killed. Righteous anger grows out of when we experience or perceive that a hurt that wounds the heart of Christ. It can be racism. It can be injustice. It can be all kinds of things. That's where righteous anger wells up, where there's greed, where people are being used and abused, trafficking, and the list can go on. That's righteous anger, and we never want to quell that. We want to let that motivate us and empower us to make a difference, just like we sang about in the opening hymn. But then there's destructive anger. That's the anger that that eats away at us, that starts out as something small and has a way of growing and consuming us. And if we let it, it will turn into rage and becomes the kind of force that can destroy lives, destroy relationships, can destroy our health and well-being. That's destructive anger. And Jesus was getting at the root of things when he talked about that. I I visited a man in prison in Marion Correctional Facility, which was for some of the worst criminals in, in the state of Ohio. And yet this guy was incredible. He was nice. He was friendly. He was the kind of person I'd like to have as a friend. And at lunchtime, we were sitting eating together, and I said, why are you here? He said, because I committed murder. He was a successful lawyer in in Ohio, and, and anger turned into rage that consumed him, and he ended up killing somebody, and his life was filled with pain as a result, and he said, I've decided that the best way for my pain to heal is for me to seek to be the kind of person God wants me to be rather than the kind of person I was when I let the anger take hold of me. An incredible person. I walked out of that prison that day richly blessed because of him. But anger can destroy life. Think about the times anger has caused you to say something that you later regretted. Think about the times that you've hurt somebody because of your anger. Let me tell you one quick story. I was busy going from hospital to hospital one day. I'd been home for lunch, and I had to go this way to the, to the west to visit some people in the hospital. And then I had to go this way to the east to visit some people in the hospital. And as Robert knows, a pastor's schedule is always more full than there are hours in the afternoon or evening. And I was getting ready to go off. My mind was engaged in stuff. And one of our sons came out and said, Daddy, Daddy, wait a minute, wait a minute. And I turned in frustration and anger and said, What do you want? I mean, didn't he know I was busy doing God's work? Ha ha. And I will never, ever ever 
forget his words. Daddy, I just wanted to say I love you. Anger's dangerous stuff. Dangerous stuff. And I want to share with you on the slide some things we can do with anger that are proactive. And the first thing we can do is we can break it out. By that I mean take a break from whatever it is that's fueling your anger. Get up, do something different, change the channel, read something different, just do something different. Break what's going on. Break it out. The next thing we can do is that we can walk it out. Wonderful therapy for getting... Take a walk. It doesn't necessarily have to be three miles. It might just be a few hundred feet. But it's powerful how, how that can work. And if it needs to be three miles, do the three miles. It's well worth it. And the next thing we can do is we can think it out. We can begin to reflect on it and say, why am I so angry? What is it that I'm afraid of that's fueling that anger? Because you see, anger always grows out of one or two things, fear or hurt. What is it that's going on in my heart and life that's making me angry? When, when one of our sons was in college, he called home to say he was doing something that I just cringed. I thought, you are making the dumbest decision of your life. And I was furious. And he wasn't about to listen to my wisdom, and that didn't help the situation any. <laughs> And I was furious, and he wanted to come home, and I was going to go pick him up, and, and I knew that I had to do something because if I, if I met him in the source of anger and frustration and almost rage that I was feeling, it would not go well. And then as I thought about it and reflected about it, it dawned on me. He was about to do something that I had done when I was in college. And the moment I healed that memory and lifted it up for healing, my anger went away just like that. Think it out. Write it out. Don't don't, 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 don't. You get the idea? Don't try to clean it up. Let it flow in all its ugliness. And then take that and hand it over to God and ask for forgiveness and healing. It's amazing what can happen. Talk it out with a good friend who knows how to listen and won't try to fix you, or a therapist who hopefully knows how to listen and won't try to fix you. And the last thing is to confess it out. I could have said to pray it out, but typically when we try to pray out anger, what we do is something like this. Lord, take this anger away from me. I, I don't want it anymore. And, and that's not very helpful. When we confess it, we begin to lift up to God the things that are gnawing at our spirits. And, and even if we can't recognize them, at least we can say, Lord, I don't know what it is. Help me discover it and then heal it. That's confessing it out. Think of what that lawyer in Marion Correctional Facility, what his life might have been like had he done any of those things instead of what he did. Think of 
of what might have happened with my relationship with my son had I not had time and, and the intention of thinking it out, if I had just buried it. I could have destroyed a relationship. And Cinda knows, and Robert knows, and every pastor who's here knows that has ever done a funeral, that there are times when you do a funeral and there are family, and one part of the family sits here, and one part of the family sits here, and never will they speak to each other. There's a stone-cold silence in between. Life's too precious for that. There's so much more, but I've already extended way beyond the extensions, so I'm going to say amen. Stand, please. We will sing our last hymn. Before I share the benediction, let me remind you that we have a new member orientation tomorrow night at 6 o'clock. If you're interested in finding out more about Trinity, please come. And as a side bonus, you'll get a meal. How can you beat that? 6 p.m. in the fellowship hall. Now let us go forth in the amazing grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, filled with his spirit to live life's that are fulfilling with a deeper faith. Amen. Amen.